Welcome back for Chapter 3, Formation of a Contract, Offer and Acceptance, part of your commercial law curriculum. By now you should have a pretty good understanding of the major elements of a contract. And from here on out we're going to start to pick apart and analyze each element and understand the rules and the permutations of each. After we finish up this chapter, you should be able to delineate the difference between a proposal and an offer understand the requirements for a valid offer, differentiate between an output and a requirements contract, recognize what is required for valid acceptance, and identify the different methods of terminating an offer. You'll remember from chapter two that we talked about the different components of a contract. Offer, acceptance, consideration, mutual assent, capacity, legality, and possibly legal form. Now when you're analyzing whether or not a legally enforceable contract exists, you're going to analyze each one of these components individually. If even one of them is not there, chances are you don't have a legally enforceable contract. So we're going to spend the next several chapters breaking down offer, acceptance, consideration, so on and so forth, and make sure that you understand how to analyze each one of these components and determine whether or not they exist. Now the formation of a contract is a process. It's a process which develops in stages. It always begins with the offer. So that is where we will begin our analysis as to whether or not a contract exists. Now, the simple definition of an offer is a communication by one party, in this case the offer or, to another party, the offer e, of the intent to be bound by a contract. Critical to the definition is the intent of the offer or. In other words, unless the offeror has the requisite intent to be bound, they have not made an offer. And if there is no offer, there can be no contract. Remember, each one of these elements has to be present. So if there is no offer, there is no contract. So how do we decide whether or not the offeror had the intent to make an offer? Interestingly, what the courts use and what we will use to determine whether or not we have an offer is called the objective test for intent objective versus subjective. So what we're basically doing is looking at the actions of the parties and deciding what a reasonable person would believe happened. In other words, has the offeror acted or communicated in such a way that a reasonable offeree would believe that an offer was transmitted? And the first thing the courts are going to ask is, is the offer definite and specific? Usually, if something is definite and specific, it shows a serious intent to be bound, as opposed to something that's asking for negotiations, solicitation for proposals, or offers to bid. Take, for example, the fact scenario in your books. Uh, a student posts a sign on a kiosk saying, I am interested in selling my old textbooks and would consider around $10 a book. The second student contacts the first student and says, I'll take all your books for $10 a book. This situation does not create an offer because the first student was only soliciting bids from people. It wasn't a firm promise and it wasn't a firm commitment and therefore there's no intent. But if you change the facts slightly and the sign says, I want to sell my old textbooks, I will sell each book for $10, an offer has been created. The student is offering each used textbook with a price. The offer is clear and passes that objective intent test. And one thing you have to be very wary of is offers made in jest. Again, we're looking to the intent of the offeror. So if the offeror is joking, you may think automatically, well, there's no serious intent to be bound. However, remember, we're using this detached reasonable person standard. So even if the offeror is kidding, you're going to have to take a step back and look at the facts surrounding the situation and determine whether or not a reasonable person would believe an offer was made. Again, there's a good example in your book. Consider someone sitting at their computer when it freezes up and the friend jumps up and says, man, if somebody would give me 20 bucks for this piece of junk computer, they can have it. You pull out $20 from your pocket and say, here, I'll take it. Do we have a valid offer? Probably not, because you could tell that the person was um, saying something in jest, in frustration, the facts and circumstances, a reasonable person standing outside the situation looking in wouldn't believe that that first person really wanted to sell their computer. But you're going to want to take a look at the seminal case of Lucy versus Zemmer that's provided in your book. It deals with two friends that are drinking at a, at a bar and a contract for the sale of real estate. 
And at first blush, it may seem like you have an offer made of jest, but the court came down with a different opinion. So I commend that to your reading. Take a look at it, answer the questions for analysis, and I think that'll give you a good idea of what we mean by be careful of offers made in jest. Okay, so the first thing we look at is the offeror's intent, but there are some other things that the common law may require in order to find a valid offer. One of them is that the, uh, the price must be set somehow in the offer. The subject matter must be easily identifiable, not subject to any question, and the time for performance must be reasonable unless the parties have specified that time is of the essence. Now, I specifically skipped over that first bullet point there, the parties, uh, because I want to talk about that more specifically. The parties intending to be bound in a contract must be clearly identified. There should be no question as to who the offeror and the offeree are, and thus who will ultimately be responsible under the contract. Failure to identify the parties in an offer is fatal to the contracting process. The other thing that's important about ensuring that we have a valid offer is the offeror must actually communicate the offer. In other words, the offeree must know about the offer in order to accept it. Now, this requirement may seem rather obvious, but consider the example in your book. Uh, a family's pet turtle escapes his cage, and the family is frantic. They post on one of the trees at the end of the street that they're offering $50 for the safe return of their pet turtle. Two days later, one of the neighbors comes by and says that Charlie has wandered into the yard. Grateful, the family rushes to the neighbor's house to pick up Charlie. Can the neighbor claim the $50? Not unless the neighbor had seen the offer on the tree. If the neighbor knew nothing of the offer, he is ineligible to accept it and to receive the $50 because the law requires that the offeror communicate the offer and that the offeree know of the offer's existence for the, there to be a valid power of acceptance and a contract. Now, one question that comes up a lot is, uh, what about advertisements? Are they offers? And courts have generally come down on the side of advertisements being solicitations or invitations to negotiate rather than a contract. Typical advertisements lack certainty as to quantity and the number of intended offerees, uh, and therefore lack the specificity necessary to create a valid offer. I do want you to take a look at Exhibit 3.1, Requirements for a Valid Offer, in your book. That's a good exhibit that uh, will may help you to understand these concepts a little bit better. Okay, that brings us to the end of our analysis of the first component of a contract, the offer. Once we know that a valid offer has been made, we need to look at acceptance of the offer. Once an offer is communicated, it can be accepted. The acceptance is the response by the offeree to the offeror of an intent to be bound by the terms set out in the offer. Now you remember as part of the offer we said that the parties had to be identified and here's why. The acceptance has to be made by someone to whom the offer is directed so if the parties are not identified in the offer we don't know who the offer is made to. Take a simple example. You and your friend are sitting at a desk. You offer to sell your friend your new cell phone for fifty dollars. Somebody walking by can't jump in and say I'll take that deal and thereby accept your offer because the offer wasn't made to that person. The person identified in the offer was your friend and your friend only. So acceptance cannot be made by that person who just happens to be walking, walking by and hears the offer made. Our next concept is what's commonly known as the mirror image rule. It's very important that you understand that this mirror image rule and subsequently the mailbox rule, which we'll talk about in just a minute, are common law rules. Remember we're dealing with common law here. When we start talking about the Uniform Commercial Code, the mirror image rule and the mailbox rule are going to be changed a little. So again, we're dealing with common law only here. Now the mirror image rule is a basic rule that says the offer must be accepted unconditionally and unequivocally. Any change constitutes a counteroffer. The next rule I want to talk to you about is called the mailbox rule. And again, this is a common law interpretation. When we get to the UCC, it's going to be drastically different. But the mailbox rule essentially says when an offer is communicated by mail, the acceptance can be made through the same medium. The mailbox rule states that when an offer is communicated in the mail, the acceptance is effective upon deposit in the mail, regardless of receipt by the offeror. You can see why this would be problematic because the offeree receives the offer 
writes down on the contract that they accept, puts it in their mailbox. Now it hasn't left the mailbox in front of their house, but at that point we have a binding contract because the acceptance has taken place simply by the fact that the offer E has put that contract back in the mailbox. Now, to put another little twist on this, when we're talking about acceptance of an offer, acceptance is effective when, transmit, when transmitted if the offeree uses the same medium. So if we're talking about uh, some, an offer that was mailed and an acceptance that was mailed, that would be the same medium, acceptance effective when transmitted. If, however, the offeree uses a different medium, so let's say that the offer came in the mail and the offeree then signs the contract and sends it back via a bicycle courier. So the bicycle courier is different than the mail, it's a different medium. At that point, the offer would not be accepted until the offer or received that contract by way of the bicycle carrier because it was a different medium. One important thing to understand, in a contract, we can change the terms of the mailbox rule. So if we have a, uh, an agreement between the offeror and the offeree that specify the mode of acceptance and specify the time of acceptance, we can overcome this presumption under the mailbox rule. Now there's a couple of different ways we can determine whether or not the offer was accepted. Oral acceptance would be where the offeror actually hears the assent. So we're standing next to each other, I say I'll sell you my cell phone for $50 you say I will buy your cell phone for fifty dollars offer made and accepted I'm the offeror I heard the acceptance we now have a contract the other way would be implied acceptance we're standing in front of each other I say I will sell you my cell phone for fifty dollars you take out fifty dollars you put it in my hand you never said anything but your actions imply acceptance So. In general, we have no acceptance by silence or inaction, but if there is some action on, on the part of the offeree that implies acceptance, we may have a contract. So we've talked about offer, we've talked about acceptance, but there is the possibility of terminating the offer prior to acceptance. So let's spend just a minute on that. One way is by the action of the parties. We've already talked about this. A counter offer. The mirror image rule requires um, acceptance of the offer as is, right? If the uh, offer E changes any term, we have a counter offer. Therefore, the original offer made by the offeror has been terminated, and the counter offer is now on the table. If the offeree rejects, either written, oral, or implied by their actions, then the offer is terminated. Um, a revocation uh, up until acceptance, the offeror can revoke their offer and then expiration. If there's no specified time in the contract, the courts will impose a reasonable amount of time for which the, the offer remains open. There are also some ways that an offer can be terminated by operation of law. These are factors that are outside the contractual party's control. Um, we talked about one earlier, the legality of the subject matter. We talked about the widgets being legal to sell when the contract is made. Uh, or in this case the offer is made but uh, there's an intervening factor like the legislature getting together and saying widgets are dangerous you can no longer sell them that would automatically terminate the offer just as it would make um, the contract unenforceable if the offeror dies before acceptance then the offer is considered terminated likewise if the uh, offeror becomes clinically insane before the offer is accepted the offer is considered terminated finally akin to that example we talked about with unenforceable contracts if the subject matter is destroyed prior to the acceptance of the offer the offer is considered terminated so our example was um, I offered to sell you all of the corn in my field and prior to accepting that offer uh, a swarm of locusts comes through and eats all of my corn it no longer exists automatically as long as that corn no longer exists the offer is considered terminated. Now all of the things we've talked about today uh, can be overcome by agreement of the parties. What we're dealing with here is the common law way of interpreting contracts. Always keep in mind that uh, two adults who have the capacity to contract can agree to just about anything as long as it's not illegal. So when we're drafting an offer we want to be specific as to the matter of acceptance uh, when acceptance will be effective, the expiration of our offer, and so on. 
Uh, another strategy is to request that the offeree return a signed copy of the offer letter by a specified date. That's going to terminate the offer if that doesn't happen. Right? So we've talked about offer, we've talked about acceptance, and we've talked about termination of an offer prior to acceptance. You should be comfortable with these concepts at the end of this chapter. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, don't hesitate to contact me, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.